Uh, so, so I want to thank Dan, uh, Daryl and Dane for the invitation to cross the street from the Reagan Institute. So I heard that I can get gas mileage uh, refund on that one. So, so what I thought I would talk about today is something, a little bit of an introduction to this platform technology that we developed over the last few years. Um, really trying to understand how we can improve the development of vaccines or monoclonal therapeutics against targets where empirical design of therapeutics and vaccines have failed. And so how do we define the biological mechanisms of the immune system that function naturally to control those pathogens, and how can we use that information to rationally design next generation vaccines or therapeutics? And so the approach we've taken um, is really to try to look at the model that we think is most relevant, and that's in humans, that are infected with these particular pathogens, that resist infection, or that control that infection, and to understand what the immunological correlates and really focus on the humoral correlates of protection, what they really look like, and to use that information then to try to think about how we can design um, more effective therapeutics. And so what the platform really does is to try to develop a suite of high throughput technologies that allow us to really try to understand antibodies and all their glory, all the different biological functions that they may have. And um, what you'll see from this is that we've been able to develop this to, to really optimize this technology, it's very flexible, to really interrogate a wide range of pathogens. We started off really by looking at HIV, moved to malaria, flu, fungi, hepatitis B, and others. But the story I want to talk about today is um, one that I think is kind of a little bit fun, and that's to talk about tuberculosis. And the reason I thought it would be fun to talk about TB today is for two reasons. First is that a third of the world is infected with TB, so it's an important target. And secondly, because the dogma, at least for the last decade, or so has been that T cells are the most important cellular function, the most important immunological function we have to fight against this particular pathogen. And hopefully what I'll convince you of today is that maybe that paradigm is not necessarily correct. And so thinking about other types of immunological functions may be critical for developing vaccines that will have a more important impact on the disease. So when we think about TB, we think about two clinical states that exist in those who are infected. And really, this is kind of a heterogeneous uh, type of clinical, di uh, clinical diagnostic sort of um, state. But, um, but it's important to just think about how we think about TB. So 95 to 99% of individuals who are infected with, with TB will control the pathogen, and they will be called latently infected. And so these individuals contain the bacteria within these very interesting um, architectures within the lungs called granulomas. And the bug can replicate in there, even when they're latently infected and can survive within this type of contained environment. And then for whatever reason that's not fully completely understood is that a subset of those individuals, one to 5% of individuals, will at some point lose control of their bacteria and they will become actively infected and these bugs will start to proliferate very, very, very aggressively within these granulomas and eventually will leak out and cause disseminated disease which is, which is really associated with the symptoms of active disease and eventual mortality. And so one thing that I want to point out is that um, to date we don't have an immunological correlate that distinguishes people who are actively or latently infected. So understanding why these people can contain the infection may be critically important to developing more effective therapeutics. But we don't even have a diagnostic test. So we can't even tell these two individuals um, apart um, without doing an x-ray on the lungs, which is really not a practical test that um, can be done in sort of the rural areas of Africa or India or um, South America. So really developing a way to distinguish these two disease states is critical, but also understanding the immunological parameters associated with the containment of the bacteria is key to understanding how we can make better monoclonal therapeutics or vaccines. So we came into this question a couple years ago and thinking to ourselves, well, if, um, if antibodies are important, how could antibodies control a bacterial infection? So really this got us thinking really from the very, very beginning about how antibodies control disease. And so what I'm showing you here is a very simplistic model of how we think antibodies might contribute to the containment of different types of pathogens. And this model really we think applies to any intracellular pathogens, and I'm just using here a little uh, pathogen or bug as an example. So the dogma really is, is that once that pathogen enters within a tissue environment, that pathogen will infect one cell and eventually infect another cell and cause a sort of localized foci of infection. And the idea really is, is that the immune system has a short window of time to try to contain that. And once one of those, back, one of those pathogens or one of those infected cells escapes is really when we get disseminated disease and we think the immune system has sort of lost that battle. And so really thinking about the immunological mechanisms that keep those um, pathogens in check in this very early window of time is really what we think is key to developing more effective uh, vaccine-induced responses.
So the dogma in the field really is, in the vaccine field, is that if we generate antibodies that can block this initial step of infection, these elusive neutralizing antibodies or opsonizing antibodies that contain the bugs in that initial state, these are the most important antibodies that we can induce through a vaccine-induced immune response. Well, it turns out that those are not the kinds of antibodies that protect us from most diseases, both following most clinically approved vaccines nor following most infections. So what we do is we try to make those antibodies, and in some cases we do succeed in making those antibodies, but most often what protects us from disease is a different class of antibodies Then instead of seeing those first um, bugs that enter into the tissue, they actually see a different class of antigens that are expressed on the surface of the first infected cells. And these antigens may be completely different, they may expose different types of antigens to the immune system. And so these antibodies are important because they don't just label the cells as being infected, but they also are generated in a way and they're poised so that they're poised to very rapidly and very effectively recruit innate immune cells from within those tissue localized compartments to very rapidly and very effectively eliminate those first infected cells and those first infected foci. So we got really excited about these types of antibodies a couple years ago, and we thought, well, how can we look at this as objectively as possible? How can we try to develop high throughput technologies that allow us to look at these particular antibodies against the pathogen of interest? And here, of course, it's tuberculosis. So we start, started thinking about how these antibodies work and what are the biophysical characteristics so we can really hone in on these correlates of immunological protection as well as the mechanisms by which they mediate their particular mo uh, action against the pathogen. So how do these antibodies work? So when a cell becomes infected, um, antigens are expressed on the surface of the cell, and these antigens act as baits for antibodies raised by the immune system. And these antibodies really have three functions. The first thing that they do is they label the cells as being infected, and that's important because the innate immune system, our first line of defense, are naive. They don't have antigen-specific receptors. They cannot recognize these cells as specifically infected. So these are really um, the, the markers of something uh, going wrong. The second thing that these antibodies do is they act as beacons that draw in innate immune cells and bring them in close enough that they can basically tether them to the surface of the cell so they can immediate some type of antiviral or antimicrobial function. And the third thing and very important thing that they do is the antibodies provide very specific instructions to the innate immune system on how those targets should be eliminated. And that's important because the antibodies can drive anything from cytokine secretion, phagocytosis, and case of cytotoxicity, complement um, activation, neutrophil um, uh, uh, activation, phagocytosis, cytosis, um, antigen uh, presentation through dendritic cells to T cells, and even mo more recently, um, antibodies can get into the cytoplasm of cells and can drive innate immune antiviral functions or antimicrobial functions by detonating antiviral or antimicrobial mechanisms within the cell. So we got excited about this. We thought, well, how does the immune system control all this biological activity? And how can we figure out why this antibody mediates this function, this antibody mediates this function? What are the biophysical features of those antibodies so we can understand how we can make better therapeutics or understand what our vaccine target needs to look like to mediate more effective protective immunity? So, so when we think about an antibody, um, I'm showing you an IgG here, but this really does apply to um, all antibody isotypes. Um, the antibodies can be divided into two functional domains. So the top domain is the variable domain that's involved in neutralization, opsonization. It's really the domain that we think just tethers the antibody to the surface of whatever it is it wants to see. So it's really just the tethering domain. And the second domain is the constant domain. This is a complete misnomer. It is not constant at all. Antibodies change very rapidly during immunological immune responses. They change in multiple different ways to really drive a huge array of different types of immunological functions, some of which I mentioned before, but also involved in immune regulation, B cell survival, allergic responses, many, many different functions. And so how can we deconvolute that complexity and understand how all of these different types of functions are induced by this tiny little um, uh, protein? So two modifications we make to our antibodies during an immune response. The first thing that we can do is we can obviously change the subclass of the antibody when we're talking about IgGs. So we have four subclasses in humans, each with different affinities for FC receptors or complements. So we have four flavors of function we can induce th through subclass alone. But we make a second modification to our antibodies, and that's through the change of a sugar that's lodged between the arms of the antibody, the glycosylation, where we can choose up to 35 different structures. 32 are common. There's a couple others. But 32 different glycan structures that we can select very rapidly during immune response to tune the affinity of antibodies to different types of innate immune receptors. So the neat thing about this is when you think about this, you've got four subclasses and 32 different glycan uh, uh, structures we can add on to an antibody. That gives us a theoretical sort of 
um, range of about 125 different functional flavors on an antibody, which we think is really the immunological barcode that the immune system uses to direct different kinds of innate immune function. But the mathematical sort of complexity gets a little bit more exciting when we think about how an immune response actually is induced during, during um, an infection or following vaccination. And so we never target a pathogen with a single antibody, right? We never make a single specificity or a single type of antibody, but we make billions of antibodies during an immune response that each theoretically have their own immunological barcode. So when we start thinking about the possibility that every immune complex may have a different barcode, we start thinking about this beautiful mathematical complexity where we have these complicated three-dimensional or four-dimensional or however many dimensional barcodes that exist within the immune system that we believe is fully controlled at the time of B cell priming. So how do we begin to deconvolute this beautiful complexity to understand the signatures or the barcodes that are associated with protection against one disease um, or resistance from another disease? How do we understand what the signature is against tuberculosis so we can guide the future generation of more effective uh, vaccines. So there are really thousands of antibody features that we can analyze during, um, that are induced in a humoral immune response. And it's really dissatisfying as um, a vaccinologist that we really only study two or maybe three of these features to guide the selection or down selection of future vaccines. And so really what our goal was over the last uh, uh, few years was to develop high throughput technologies that allow us to interrogate all these different types of humoral immune diversity features so we can think about which ones really matter in the context of protective immune responses. So we came up with this uh, neat little sort of platform technology we call system serology, where we can take plasma from infected individuals, vaccinated individuals, monkeys, mice, you name it. We take this plasma and we subject it to two different types of immunological interrogation. On the top, we do biophysical uh, profiling of the antibodies, where we simply ask, what is the abundance of any particular subclass of antibodies for up to 500 different antigens, peptides, scaffolds, whatever is interesting um, in the context of a luminex-based assay. We can also purify the antigen-specific antibodies and ask how do they bind to FC receptors as well as ask how are they glycosylated in unique and different ways in different patient populations. We take the same plasma and we subject it to an array of different high throughput technologies where we ask how well do these antigen specific antibodies fix complement, thrive neutrophil activation, monocytes, phagocytic activity, and K cell cell toxicity, dendritic cell activation, T cell presentation, epithelial binding, mucosal trapping, really the sky's the limit on how many different types of innate immune mechanisms we can uh, interrogate. But we take all this different type of information and we use different kinds of computational um, algorithms to look for profiles that correlate with control of disease, resistance of disease, or lack of symptoms. How can we understand what are the profiles that matter most? So just to give you an idea of what this data looks like, if we took every single person's blood in this room, everyone would have a different antibody fingerprint. So this is just an example of this type of analysis where we took 100 subjects, um, healthy individuals, and we profiled about 120 different features of their humoral immune response, including their FC, bi FC receptor binding characteristics, their subclass distribution, their um, uh, glycosylation. And what you can see here is every individual is different. There are some individuals that look more similar than others, where we get this sort of clustering of some individuals that have some humoral profiles that are somewhat similar. But how do we extract anything that's meaningful from this type of information? Well, so the way we do that is by doing different types of clustering algorithms where we can look for profiles that associate with a good outcome versus a bad outcome or a good target or a bad target. And just to give you an example of what that data looks like, if we take the same data set here and just do a regular, very basic PCA, what you can see is that there are some individuals, for whatever reason, generate antibodies that like to bind better to FC gamma R3 receptors that are present on NK cells and neutrophils, whereas other individuals like to bind better to FC gamma R2, which is involved in phagocytosis, and others like to bind to lectins. So there's biologically meaningful information here. It's an incredibly rich data set. And so understanding how to generate these assays, to develop these platforms for the target pathogen of interest, and maybe it doesn't have to be a pathogen only, um, but just is trying to understand how we can find these clustering or these signatures that provide hints about what an antibody is really doing to provide protection from disease. So this all began for us with TB when Sarah Fortune, a, a wonderful friend and colleague over from the Harvard School of Public Health, asked us, well, you've developed this technology for HIV and flu and Ebola and dengue. Why can't you apply it to TB? And I said, there's really no reason at all. Let's give it a try. So we contacted a good friend who was living in South Africa, Cheryl Day, who had collected um, large populations of individuals with tuberculosis infection, um, very, very well clinically um, sort of categorized with um, very rigorous uh, clinical data sets. And we went in completely blinded and asked the question, are there differences in the antibody profiles between these two different, between active and latent disease that could tell us about why or if antibodies really matter um, to control this particular pathogen? 
So Cheryl sent us 42 individual samples from um, Cape Town. Um, there were 22 latently infected individuals and 20 actively infected individuals. We were blinded at the time the samples arrived. We were re-blinded when they um, started getting profiled. And once we were de or once we were unblinded, I'm just going to show you the aggregate data here after collecting 80 different data points on these antibody profiles, um, really targeting TB-specific antigens. What we found was something really remarkable, and that was that you could completely differentiate someone who was actively infected from someone who was latently infected just by looking at antibody FC profiles. And so this was, and there was 95% classification accuracy in this very small cohort. And we added more individuals, and now we can really um, uh, get much more robust separation. But I think the important point here is that in, this, such, in a situation, a clinical situation where we don't have a diagnostic test, this is really exciting, that now just by measuring some feature of antibodies, and we've distilled this down to just two features are required to, di to create this diagnostic test, um, we can separate people who are actively infected and, and latently infected in the context of a, of a point of care diagnostic that can be used in the field anywhere in the world. But that's not where the story ends, right? So it's interesting we get sort of this diagnostic potential out of these types of antibody characteristics, but the real key to us was understanding, do they have biological function, and is this just a correlate, or is this potentially a mechanism of control of the infection, and can we use that information then to guide the generation of more effective therapeutics in the future? So I'm going to just run through the functional data with you one by one just to give you an idea of how different these antibodies are really at a functional state, and really to our surprise, for every innate immune cell, there were differences between the diseases. So first, let's just look at how well these antibodies recruit natural killer cells to mediate ADCC. So just to give you an idea here, latents in the blue, actives in the red, huge differences in the ability of these antibodies to recruit this innate immune cell subset to very rapidly and very effectively destroy any cells to which those antibodies are bound. And this was really remarkable. Importantly, the activity was antigen specific. We could deplete out all the TB reactive antibodies, or most of them, let's say, with um, a mishmash of antigens called PPD, and we could see the significant significant decline in the bioactivity of these antibodies, and so I really no activity in the actively infected individuals. So already, in this context of these two different uh, disease states, we see this remarkable difference in the ability to recruit NK cells. So we said, okay, well, what about monocytes? Is this the same feature across the board, that latent antibodies are just great at recruiting all innate immune cells, or is there some nuance into how they recruit different types of innate immune cells um, during the infection? So we looked at monocyte-induced um, uh, phagocytosis, and the picture was completely reversed. Now the antibodies from the actively infected individuals form these opsonized complexes that got into monocytes much more effectively, really driving very rapid phagocytic clearance of anything to which those antibodies are bound. So really an inverse functional activity from the two disease states. And again, the activity was antigen specific. We could deplete the biological activity out by removing the TB specific antibodies. So there's really something different about these types of antibodies um, induced in different disease states. So what about another phagocytic cell? So we took neutrophils now and we did the same phagocytic assay, and again, the actives in the red did a little bit better than the latents in the blue, um, and the activity was always specific, but something was really interesting with the neutrophils that we did not anticipate, and that was that once these opsonized particles got into the cells, they induced different types of antimicrobial states within the innate immune cells. So now all of a sudden, we see that more complexes get into the actives, but once they're in, they don't really activate the neutrophils to do anything really antimicrobial to recognize that there's a pathogen in there. But the latently infected um, antibodies really drove very high levels of nitric oxide. So once they're in, they can actually arm the neutrophils to destroy the pathogen um, within them as well as around them. So again, differences in biological activity. So what about dendritic cells? We all think that T cells are important in the, in the destruction of tuberculosis and the control of TB. So you want to ask, do these immune complexes make any difference in how they load dendritic cells to prime more effective T cell immunity? So when we take these phagocytic responses, we can see there's really no difference in the ability of dendritic cells to pick up anti any bead that you coat with any type of antibody. They really pick up everything. But once they get in, we start to see these really interesting differences in how the dendritic cells matured and how well they could upregulate these um, co-stimulatory molecules like CD86, where only the latent antibodies were able to really arm the dendritic cells to present antigen in a form that will truly induce more effective T cell immunity. So again, a complete difference between the actives and latents, and it's again antigen specific. So how do these antibodies do this? How do we produce antibodies in latent and active disease that are able to recruit such different types of biological activities? So our first guess was that they were, must be binding to FC receptors in different ways. So we first asked the question, how will they bind to FC gamma R2, which is involved in phagocytic 
activity. And we saw there was really no difference in the ability of the antibodies to bind to this particular FC receptor. So what about its inhibitory counterpart? Really no difference in binding to that receptor. But when we looked at the FC receptor involved in ADCC activity, as well as neutrophil activity, and as well as abregulodon dendritic cells, what we saw was this very significant difference in the ability of the antibodies from latently infected individuals to bind to this FC receptor. So that was really interesting. So we thought, okay, so naturally we're generating antibodies that can bind to this FC receptor in different ways. So are we doing this by selecting particular subclasses of antibodies that are directed at TB, or are we doing this through another modification like glycosylation? So when we looked at subclass changes across the board, there were really no differences across the patient groups, um, with the exception of a tiny little bit of IgG4, which we think is not really functional anyhow. But really, there was no evidence that subclass selection differences were driving this different biological activity within these uh, patient populations. So we thought, well, maybe it has to do with glycosylation differences. Maybe these individuals are generating IgGs in different ways that are just decorated with different types of sugars. So I'm not going to get it too deep into the um, glycobiology of antibody glycosylation, but suffice it to say that among the 35 different structures we can add on to an antibody, they can be classified grossly into two categories. There are structures that are considered to be inflammatory. These are short structures that lack a sugar, this yellow thing here called galactose. So they're called G0. They've got no galactose. And then we have longer structures over here that have lots of these little yellow sugars. And these are called galactosylated antibodies. And if they have two galactoses, they're called G2s. So we would simply want to ask the question, is there just an inflammatory biomarker difference in the level of this G0 or G2 structures induced in um, latent and active TB. So these are the two structures that we looked for. And what you see here is completely black and white picture. The latently infected individuals induce very low levels of these inflammatory types of glycans, very high in the actives. And the reverse is true for the anti-inflammatory uh, glycans on the PPD-specific antibodies. And if you just take all the glycan patterns on TB-specific antibodies across the patient populations and do an unsupervised clustering analysis, you see very clearly that the actives and the latents cluster as completely two separate populations of individuals with the exception of one active individual that kind of got misclassified. But in general, what this shows you is the heterogeneity in this disease profile that exists in TB infections. So it's not really two completely distinct states, but there is this sort of natural sort of diversity in the disease um, that is really marked by this uh, glycosylation uh, differences in biology. We went ahead and we profiled a second cohort, a Texas a cohort from Texas, um, uh, just to make sure that this was not a geographically specific difference that we saw um, in the TB-specific antibody glycosylation. We saw the exact same differences in the second cohort to just to validate that these differences are really meaningful and associated with the disease rather than associated with um, being from South Africa. So, so just to leave you with one last thought here is that these um, antibody profiles can be looked at sort of as networks. So think about how antibodies work together as sort of these immune complexes. And so to try to understand this, um, Doug Laufenberger's group helped us generate networks of these antibody features. And the point I want to make here is simply that if we look at the networks of antibody features that are induced in the context of latent disease versus active disease, we see that there is fundamentally different architectures into how these antibodies are induced to tackle or to really drive control of those particular uh, bacteria. And so really very um, strongly influenced by the glycans um, on the TB-specific antibodies. So, so that was great. So now we see that these antibodies are not just biomarkers. They actually have functional dif activity differences between the two different states. But the question, of course, is do they have antimicrobial activity, or are they just there to activate different types of innate immune mechanisms? So we designed a very simple experiment where we could take primary macrophages, infect them with tuberculosis, add on antibodies, and then simply ask whether or not these antibodies have any impact once we, re we reactivate the bacteria um, to really start to grow and proliferate within the, the, um, within the macrophages. And so all we did is count on a single macrophage level is how many of the bacteria were alive in the presence of antibodies in the green versus those that had been destroyed because they have the red reporter but do not express the GFP that's induced upon um, uh, bioactivity. So just to give you an idea what this data looked like, this is the survival activity of the bacteria. When they're not induced, you have very low survival, so very low GFP levels. If you now induce them, you get a very high expression of the GFP, so really robust activity of the uh, bacteria within the macrophages. If you add the 
active infected antibodies, so these guys that are not really controlling their bacteria, you see the bacteria grow perfectly well. They're all completely unabated, and if anything, maybe even a little bit higher than what we saw in the no antibody control. So maybe they're facilitating these bacteria to grow just a tiny bit better. But when we added the latently infected antibodies, all of a sudden we saw a diminution in the activity of the bacteria within the particular primary macrophages, really suggesting that these antibodies are really somehow arming the macrophages to somehow drive the restriction of the bacteria within the cells. So importantly, to prove to ourselves that this is an antigen-specific antibody activity, we can deplete out, again, the, the TB-specific antibodies using this mishmash of antigens from TB. Um, no difference in the active antibodies because, of course, they had no antimicrobial activity. But when we did that in the latently infected antibodies, we see this increase in the survival of, mac of, the, bac of the bacteria within the macrophages in the absence of the antigen-specific antibodies, telling us that it's something really specific about these antibodies that are arming the macrophages to destroy and limit um, uh, the, bio the survival of the macrophages. So we comb to try to understand what the immunological mechanism could be that these antibodies are inducing in the macrophages to limit bacterial survival. And just to make a long story short, um, it turns out that these antibodies are arming the inflammasome. So what they do is these antibodies, when we add them to primary macrophages infected with tuberculosis, with the latent antibodies, they induce these really interesting inflammasome specs, these ASK specs. Um, and we do not see them come up in the presence of the um, active antibodies. If you just quantify on a single macrophage level the number of these inflammatory chromosome specs, these ASK specs. In primary macrophages, we see this incredibly high induction of the inflammasome activity with the latent antibodies, not with the actives. And we can see the validation of the activity of the inflammasome with the induction of cytokines associated with inflammasome activity. So these antibodies are arming these anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial responses in the macrophages that are containing the bacteria and really driving this um, lack of survival. So in the context of an infection where antibodies were really regarded as sort of bad biomarkers of disease, I think we can argue from these types of analyses that these antibodies may be contributing to antimicrobial control and potentially important biological uh, uh, features of the immune system that, are, if driven, can drive um, antimicrobial control. And what we see here is that there's these fundamental differences that really point to the difference in the biological activity, really pointing to how these antibodies are driving uh, this type of bacterial restriction. So the question I always get asked is, well, that's great. So now you have the signature of antibodies with certain glycan patterns that are associated with better disease outcome in TB. How do we program anti vaccines to induce these different types of um, uh, humoral immune profiles? How can we induce a very specific type of glycan so we can get the right kind of biological activity? So just with one last slide, I just want to point out sort of how these glycosylation profile works. So antibodies are generated in the ER um, with a very uniform glycan, this oligo high oligomannose. And as a trans to the Golgi apparatus, it encounters different kinds of enzymes, so glycosyltransferases and glycosidases. And it's the combination of different enzymes within this Golgi compartment that lead to the production of antibodies with highly uniform glycans from, within, from um, that particular B cell. And what we've seen so far um, in the literature as well as um, in the laboratory is that many different types of innate immune cells as well as adaptive immune cells can influence the regulation of these particular glycosylation profiles. And just to make this story, um, just to really um, sort of just uh, point out how different these profiles um, um, can, how they can be guided through vaccination. What we did here is a very nice little study with Bob Cedar and Joe Francisca from the um, Vaccine Research Center, where they immunized monkeys with um, HIV envelopes and different types of adjuvants. So here we have alum, alum with TLR7, MFD9, and poly IC. And what we did is um, blindly looked at glycosylation profiles on the envelope specific antibodies, as well as particular functions, including NKD granulation, ADCC, phagocytosis, and then deconvoluted the data to look to see if different adjuvants can drive these different types of functions. And so what you see here is every dot here represents one monkey. This is just a PCA of the data. Just to illustrate how easily the immune system is able to control these different types of profiles of antibodies. So what I'm showing you here is the envelope immunized animals alone have a profile that is really not very different than PBS unimmunized animals. So the antibody glycans don't shift, no, neither do the functions. If we add alumin, we shift the profile up into a completely different type of immunological sort of glycosylation uh, background, where now all of a sudden they have very high levels of galactose and even have some sialic acid, which make them likely um, anti-inflammatory. We add TLR7, we push the profile to induce very high levels of NK cell activation, add poly IC, now a TLR3 agonist, all of a sudden we get huge amounts of ADCC and phagocytic activity and push that profile even further 
further now with MFD9 and get a completely different class of functions, including complement activity. So just by tweaking the inflammatory background during vaccination, we can skew glycosylation to target the specific functions we think are important simply through changing the glycosylation of the antibody FC backbone. So hopefully what I'll leave you with then is that active and TB disease induce dramatically different antibody FC profiles. And these FC profiles are not just biomarkers of differences in the disease control, but also may mechanistically contribute to antimicrobial containment through the activation of the inflammasome. And I think what I think is important, at least for this particular group here, is that this antibody glycosylation is controllable via vaccination, so really is a target um, sort of uh, uh, mode of action um, sort of approach that we can change the biological activity of our antibodies to really learn from our patients of how we can generate more effective vaccines and therapeutics. So with that, I want to thank the people who did this work. Um, none of this would be possible without Sarah Fortune, my partner in crime in the TB world. This work was done by three fantastic postdocs, Lynette, who really spearheaded the work, a clinical fellow from Mass General, um, Manu, who helped us with the um, um, analysis of the networks of antibodies, collaborators in uh, South Africa as well as in Texas who gave us samples, Doug for all of his expertise on the analytical side, Bob for samples. And then unfortunately, I was not able to show you one of the slides because it corrupted the um, AV, um, uh, the AV uh, work. But um, Rick, who's been helping us at BI to actually define the antigens that are being hit by these antibodies uh, to mediate protective activity. And so with that, I thank you for your attention.